Three George Sick One. Have a mark. Jonathan Lethem's book, Motherless Brooklyn, came out in the late 90s. And I was so taken with this central character in it, Lionel Esrog, and his affliction, which is a combination of Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. Can't you ever cut that out? I'm sorry. Touch it, Bailey. I'm sorry. Someone tipped me off about it and said, you're going to want to read this. I managed to get it before it hit the streets. And I reached out to try to secure the rights to the book. We've been developing the script since 2001, so it's been a very uh, methodical process. We embarked on the journey to make it into a film before it was officially even a book. <laughs> and action. I had this notion that I wanted to do something fairly unorthodox with it. The novel's a contemporary story. I was going to kind of take the character and transpose him into a story different from the plot of the novel. And fortunately, Jonathan Lethem agreed. I had to have old school pro actors able to roll with the craziness of me being on both sides of the camera. I needed the opposite of method actors. I needed people who were like stagecraft professionals who were able to engage with me in a highly technical way, have me break out, say, let's do this instead, and not lose the moment. Go, 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 go. That way we have something for the green screen shots of that. Come on, we're losing them. We're losing them. Yeah, fast. What do you want? Well, Come on! Quack a quarter, quarter! What? Quack a quarter, quarter! What? We need a quarter, get a quarter out! Quarter. Why didn't you say something? Get it out, get it out! Come the on. thing about being friends with somebody like that is there's a sort of shorthand. They don't have to worry about your feelings. They don't have to worry about, you know, is it okay if I tell you what I think it should be? This has been a great experience creatively, working with him and having him teach me what he wants to have in his pocket for the cut of the film. One more time, and that's it. Just throw the look for it was fun to play scenes with him. He was very fluid in making adjustments. The rhythm and the music of the text and how it's written, it's like uh, playing a duet. That's good. I got to remember that one. If. Yeah, well, that's the rubber life, all right. If, if only. As an actor, he's really aware of the camera and the placement of the camera to give the best performance, not only for him, but for the other actors as well. It can be strange when you're acting with someone who's directing you also, but the wonderful thing about Edward's experience as an actor is he gets it. There's certain unspoken actory things that he is thinking too, and he understands and is able to articulate. He just switches from director. Let's go again from where we were. We go on the stairs. And he turns into Lionel effortlessly. One second we're talking, we're catching up about the kids, and the next, here we are, having this like really charged emotional scene. And I had to stop. <laughs> I hadn't seen Edward do the Tourette's thing yet. I said, hey man, let's just take a break because I have to recalibrate here. I forgot how good you are. <laughs> sell it and tell it, let a man. Take tell it, it and sell it. Take it easy, have a drink. I had been for a long time very interested in what was going on in New York in the late 50s. Motherless Brooklyn was this great vehicle for going into this incredible secret history to New York, how the old city got converted into the modern city. If I want to build highways while the rest of the country is broke, I'll punch through any damn neighborhood I want. How the roads, bridges, and the tunnels, and the housing projects really got made is a really deep and dark story. Decimating low-income neighborhoods in order to build roads and bridges and so forth. There's so many parallels with what's going on today people who have power and money and how they abuse it and what they will do to maintain their power. I felt that the characters in the book have a very film noir, gumshoe sensibility. In the 40s and the 50s, coming out of the war, you had this very particular sense of, like, America's ascendance. But with noir, what you got was people making films that said, hang on a second, let's peel the edge back and down and under everything that's going on, there's a lot of really dark stuff happening here. The noir hero, he's not part of the mainstream culture. He's an outsider and a kind of underdog hero that you root for. I think that Lionel, being an underdog outsider, has a foot in that role. It's like a piece of my head broke off and got a life of its own and then just decided to keep joy riding me for kicks. Kicks and ticks. There is nothing that Edward isn't deeply involved in during the making of this movie. It's a beautiful screenplay, and it was clearly a passion project. The brilliance of that mind, he wrote it. He's directing, he's starring. Keep it together, freak show. He produced the film along with all the other producers. Directing actors, talking to department heads, and then sliding into a performance that is at once incredibly nuanced and detailed. Sorry. It's nothing short of thrilling. She doesn't know! 
She doesn't know. What don't I know? Directing a movie is almost antagonistic to the state of mind you want to be in as an actor. Things have to be ordered and lined up just right. You want to be out of your head when you're acting, and you've got to have your head on top of everything when you're directing. As much as any director I've ever worked with, he's so prepared. Even tighter, tighter eye line. And he's so clear about exactly what he wants from every scene. You know, you're going to have to make sure you don't just do your arm. I think you're going to have to set it and boom, send your whole body and waist and everything, because it's not really your arm that's going to take this out. It's your waist. Yes. OK. This story really celebrates the richness of what New York has always been. It's almost like a love letter to New York. It's a magic place to shoot, but doing the 50s in modern New York, it's a logistical nightmare. The challenge is traffic and exteriors and making sure that you don't have your reflections and your street signs and phone booths, which don't exist anymore. Doing big car chases and doing things at the scale we did them, it was a really intense operation. As far as locations and the feel of 1950s New York, we had to go places that are disappearing. We found these wonderful sections of the city that haven't been converted or overbuilt and still exist in their previous form. Evoking that period has been a great deal of fun. We recreated Penn Station in a gigantic hangar out on Long Island, one of the great destroyed architectural masterpieces of America, and brought it back to life. The thing about Tourette's, it's an improvisational condition. For my ass, Bailey. It expresses itself in very original ways in each person. You got a head just like mine, always boiling over, turning things around. But that's music. Some people call it a gift, but it's a brain affliction just the same. Lionel is experiencing the visceral impact that jazz has upon him, understanding that there is a world in which he doesn't feel abnormal. Writing the score with Daniel Pemberton, we started realizing we were going to write this very classical jazz score, where you have a period sensibility, but you have a modernism cutting through it that makes it more emotionally visceral. Because of Lionel's brain and our intention to cinematically depict the way his brain works, I knew I wanted to have like soundscapes that were not naturalistic. When we first meet Lionel in the car, the drums are very fidgety. They're kind of moving around. I wanted the audience to like be taken into his head. I got to my head, man. Edward has really allowed the music to be a character in this film. This amazing performances in the film from Winter Marseilles and his band. Winton played all of the trumpet solo through the whole orchestral score. Trumpet players at Jazzmatazz. <laughs> oh. I wanted to have one song that was the musical stand-in for Lionel's inner life. Tom York came up with it, and it was amazing. We talked a bit about what the film was about, and he said, I've got an idea. I threw this down. It's see if you think this fits. I was sitting on the edge of the bed at like 6 in the morning in tears because it was just so beautiful, like one of those ballads that he's so famous for. It really captures Lionel's personality and his isolation and loneliness. I said to Winton, what if you did a late 50s Miles Davis ballad-style arrangement of Tom's song? Tom was like, that's just the best thing I've ever heard. It's in the film, voiced by him, and then it returns sort of in the tissue of the period in its jazz incarnation. Winter Marseille and Tom York, it's like almost like trying to take both their kind of worlds and then add my world and create something that all sort of complements each other. This has been a really great opportunity. We all go, boy, I hope he keeps going. I hope he keeps making films like this. I'm just happy to be along for this glorious ride. This journey, making a film from soup to nuts, it's been exciting. I'm really proud of what we pulled off. <laughs>